the American bison, the mightiest of extant North American megafauna. I am actually privileged enough to live in a place only an hour or so from a herd of these incredible ungulates, which live out on an island in the Great Salt Lake. This is something I have taken for granted, but a little over 100 years ago, only around the number found on this rather small island existed on the entire planet, with less than a hundred roaming the wild. Up to the western expansion of the United States, some 60 million of these bovines roamed the vast open plains of the North American continent, and had sustained different cultures for thousands of years. But in the years following the U.S. Civil War, the country really got into killing bison. Bison skins were fairly valuable, and this commercial value led to wholesale slaughter. However, more concerningly, other people really wanted to exterminate the species. Train companies wanted them gone so they wouldn't damage the tracks or locomotives, so they would fill train cars with hunters that would shoot the animals as they passed by. Ranchers wanted to replace bison with their own European bovines, something I think we should undo on this continent. And finally, the U.S. military wanted to control native cultures, so they actively tried wiping out what they saw as their most important food source. Looking at these images, it is surprising there are any bison left. But eventually, some early environmentalists said enough, and were able to recover the population to some 30,000 on public lands, some truly wild, others with some restriction on where they can go, like the herd near me, confined to an island. Around the same time as the near extermination of bison, wading birds had nearly been wiped out from the southeastern U.S., with populations reduced by 95% in Florida. Driven by a demand for feathers that had become a mainstay in the era's hat fashion, it had even led to hunting of exotic birds from remote tropical places to be put on women's hats. The trade was taken down by the efforts of many early conservationists, many of which were women, like Harriet Hemingway and Mina Hall, Boston socialites who held tea parties for other wealthy women to try and convince them to stop buying plumes, while, in the UK, Etta Lemon sent notes to women wearing plumes how many birds were killed. These efforts both led to the foundation of bird conservation societies, like the National Audubon Society, but it also eventually turned the public against the fashion industry. And in 1910, legislation was introduced that ended the selling of bird plumage in New York, followed by similar legislation in other states over the next 10 years, culminating in the Migratory Bird Act of 1918. And thanks to their efforts, these birds have recovered and still grace North America's wetlands. Overexploitation by hunting, fishing, or collection is on a long list of threats to wildlife. Some one in three threatened species are facing some sort of overhunting pressure. Historically, many have theorized that the disappearance of most Ice Age megafauna was a direct result of human hunting, from mammoths to moa. The most notable example of overexploitation alone driving the extinction of a species I can find is the extinction of the great auk, a large flightless North Atlantic seabird that was mercilessly persecuted for meat, down, oil, and eventually specimens. Today, the trade in wildlife is a 200 to 300 billion dollar industry and takes many forms, both legal and illegal. Bushmeat, especially large primates, are an exotic delicacy. Exotic furs are used for clothing. Wildlife parts are used for traditional but unsubstantiated medicines. Butterflies, shells, plants, tropical fish, reptiles, and mammals are captured for collectors and hobbyists, and of course logging of certain woods has led to rampant deforestation in some parts of the world. Managing the exploitation of wildlife is the purpose of the Convention on International Trade in Endangered Species of Wild Fauna and Flora, or CITES, which regulates what species cannot be legally traded between the different signatory nations, and under what circumstances those species can be traded. The treaty is rather complex, with species of concern falling under certain appendices, or annexes in the EU, with Appendix 1 being the most threatened and so virtually impossible to trade, requiring impact studies from scientists along with both export and import permits. Appendix 2 species generally require just an export permit. And finally, Appendix 3 are species that a specific country has put on the list, 
and may not necessarily be globally threatened, but generally also require an export permit. In all, CITES regulates the international trade of some 35,000 species. However, skirting this treaty and other conservation laws is big business, with the illegal wildlife trade alone being worth some 10 to 20 billion dollars. One group of animals that has had to contend with rampant illegal overexploitation are the parrots. Colorful, intelligent, and charismatic, they have a lot of fans, some of which want to possess these denizens of the rainforest. The trade and exploitation of parrots has a long history. Long before the first Europeans set foot on North America, pre-Columbian civilizations traded macaws all the way from the rainforests around the Yucatan to the high deserts of the Colorado Plateau in what is now northern Arizona and New Mexico, where the remains of these birds have been found in archaeological sites like Wupatki National Monument and Chaco Canyon. When the U.S. formed, wild parrots lived in the forests of the southeast. Carolina parakeets, the most northerly distributed parrot species in the world, was shot in huge numbers, which in conjunction with habitat loss, caused it to go extinct. More recently, a desire to own these birds during the 70s and 80s was so bad that all parrots have some kind of international regulation under sites. Though the trade has been declining in recent years as a result of increased legislation, regulation of parrot collection in the country of origin, bans on the importation of wild birds, and access to captive bred individuals, the illegal trade still exists, and tens of thousands of parrots are still annually exported. Unregulated and trying to avoid being detected by the authorities, the conditions these parrots experience are atrocious, with 60% of birds dying between capture and sale to an owner, so many more birds have to be caught to satiate demand. Parrots are no longer even the most trafficked bird group, with songbirds in Southeast Asia now being far more exploited than parrots. Parrots make terrible pets, but if you are going to insist on getting one, make sure you know where the bird is coming from and avoid wild-caught specimens, which is generally what you want to do if you are buying any live animal. No discussion of overexploitation would be complete without talking about overfishing. Humanity has an insatiable appetite for seafood like millions of tons of seafood, and this pressure has led to one-third of fish populations in the world being considered overfished, and even driven many species of fish to become globally threatened. For example, many large sharks like hammerheads have declined by 90 to 95 percent over the last 30 years as a result of shark finning operations. All sawfish species are critically endangered and regulated by sites, and demand for bluefin tuna has led many species to be considered threatened. Atlantic bluefin are endangered, and Pacific bluefin like these are considered vulnerable. Extreme overfishing can lead to a fishery collapse, which is basically where the biomass of fish in a particular area falls dramatically, generally when fish biomass has fallen by at least 90 percent. One of the most famous examples of a fishery collapse was the Atlantic cod fishery off the coast of Newfoundland, where cod biomass fell by as much as 99% in the early 90s. The population did survive, however, and is expected to reach historic levels by around 2030, nearly 40 years after the government shut down the fishery. While the cod held out and are returning, the dramatic decline in biomass has had cascading effects on the greater ecosystem that likely have led to this long recovery time, and in some cases, if the decline of one species leads to a dramatic change in the ecosystem composition, they may never recover. The issue is that, without regulation, fisheries are a great example of the tragedy of the commons. This is a very important concept that basically says, in a case where many individual people or companies have the same access to a resource, they will each try to eke out as much as they can from the shared resource, and ultimately surpass what the resource can support, and they all lose when the resource becomes depleted to a point they can no longer continue exploiting it. In the case of the cod, fishermen try to get as many cod as possible, and while a single boat doing this was fine, hundreds of boats doing this was way over what the fish stocks could handle. Regulation has allowed some fisheries to be sustainable, and if you want to know what seafood is sustainable, go to seafoodwatch.org to find out, and generally I use it whenever I get seafood. 
Regulation, though, can only go so far, as each country's laws only extend a few kilometers out to sea. And out in international waters, nothing can stop vessels from catching as many fish as they want. Overfishing also has the negative side effect of bycatch, which is where a non-target marine creature is unintentionally caught in the fishing process. This is a huge issue and leads to the needless deaths of endangered turtles and albatross. And one particular illegal fishery in the Sea of Cortez is leading to the extinction of a porpoise species. In the extreme north of the Sea of Cortez, where the Colorado River once flowed to the sea, until water use in the southwestern U.S. made the river so low it rarely ever reaches the sea, a unique little porpoise species evolved, the vaquita. The smallest whale in modern times, its tiny, naturally restricted range overlaps with a large fish, the totoaba. This fish, a giant member of the drum family, which can grow larger than the vaquita, once spawned in the Colorado River Delta, but due to the dramatic loss of water flow to the delta, the population has declined. Then, after they wiped out their own giant drum species, the Chinese turned to this Mexican species as the swim bladders of giant drums are considered a delicacy. These two factors have driven the Toto Aba to be considered critically endangered. The money, though, is really good, so a thriving illegal fishery exists. The Mexican fishermen use gill nets, which the vaquita get entangled in, which since they are mammals, they drown. And most likely, by the time you see this video, the vaquita will no longer exist, driven extinct by the overexploitation of another species. Thank you for watching this video, though it kind of got doom and gloom at the end. Oh well. Anytime someone brings up the vaquita, it's never good news. Question, have you ever heard of the vaquita before watching this video? If not, definitely share this episode with other people. This video is part of an ongoing Fundamentals of Conservation Biology series with a new episode coming out once a month. So if you like this video, give it a thumbs up, subscribe to this channel, and ring the bell so you will be reminded when the next episode in this series comes out.